So hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and listening. I think this will become a very, very inspiring talk. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Ashinabe, Cree, Ochi, Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we, we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Sari, Brandy, as always, thank you very much for your support. I'm on an ongoing search for the last angels in landscape architecture. And it was my hope to find some in the city of angels. <laughs> we feel excited to have Jenny Jones and David Gottschall here today co-founders and partners of Terremoto Los Angeles office. David is a landscape architect and horticultural theorist. Jenny is a landscape architect and has experience as a science teacher. Both practice and practice teaching informed by their experience in practice. Quotes. Our design approach is post-internet, critically regionalist, and respectfully inflammatory. We view gardens and local landscapes as micro expressions in our wider culture. Our landscape approach in many cases strives to do a little, as little as possible. As a practice, we are explicitly a team that eschew both hierarchy and ego. I could go on and on, each sentence a statement. Okay, we could argue many texts are written like this with the hope to attract attention. Terremoto is a little bit different. They suit their actions or better, they practice to their words. Terremoto, winner of Leela Office Award 221, a prestigious, prestigious award, and the choice has been made by a distinguished jury. So we, in this guide, I quote the Landesin jury, quote, we are charmed by the portfolio of simple and well thought out spaces. But what made us fall for the office completely were their writings that reveal a, li that, that reveal a liberating spirit and refreshing attitude behind their actions. A little bit about the office name, David. It's from your interview with SARS. I was in Italy, Terremoto, the name. I was in Italy and the name popped up because it is the word for earthquakes. It's the same in Spanish. Its etymology breaks down to earth moving. But you also mentioned that for you, it sounds a little like the name of a Japanese motorcycle gang <laughs> and that's kind of cool. You said this is the right amount of ambiguity and gives freedom. There's nothing more serious than the need for radical changes while embracing joy and some fun too. So enjoy David's and Jenny's talk on how to make a radical garden in a world of broken systems. Welcome, David and Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you guys hear us okay? Sound is good. Hi. Sounds Sound is good. Uh, hi. Um, we can't see you, but uh, we're thankful that you're here, uh, whether watching or listening. Um, so, and thank you, Dietmar. Oh, we do see you now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a room full of people. Thank you for coming to listen to Jenny and I. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, we'll just kind of dive into it. Uh, we have 135 slides, which is a lot, uh, but we're ambitious in that way and we go fast. Um, the title of our lecture is How to Make Radical Gardens in a World of Broken Systems. And um, it really comes from a place that like when we uh, when we kind of look at, at the world around us, uh, whether through like an environmental, social, political lens, 
there's a lot to take on uh, in this present moment. And as makers of gardens and landscapes, uh, we uh, kind of critically examine how we go about uh, doing uh, and applying our trade uh, and how what we do comes into contact uh, with these pre-existing systems, some of which are broken. Uh, and with that, we try to make gardens and landscapes that are responsive uh, to uh, the ecosystems in which we find ourselves operating uh, and uh, try to make our gardens responsive in a way that's uh, towards good. Um, down. Mm. One second. Page. Mm. Sorry. Okay. Just I guess. Um, uh, a land acknowledgement. Terremoto recognizes and acknowledges the Tongva, Keech, Fernandeño, Tataviam, Chumash, Ahachimin, Serrano, Pomo, Wapo, Coast Miwok, and Ohlone peoples as the original as the original inhabitants and stewards of the lands on which we now live and work in California. We honor the ancestral stewards of these landscapes and recognize that the plants, wildlife, and living systems would not be what they are today if not for the thousands of years of care and highly skilled cultivation carried out by the native peoples. Um, much in the spirit of uh, the land acknowledgement that uh, you made, Dietmar, which was uh, very uh, elegantly put, um, we also tried to take these words and uh, imbue them with action. Uh, we're an action-oriented office, and um, we're actually, to that effect, working with um, several tribes on land back initiatives uh, presently. I'm going to quickly do an origin story. Before this lecture, I looked at Jenny and I said, how much longer do we need to do the origin story for? Is it still interesting? And she said, not much longer. So this might be the last one. Um, the, uh, where the office is about uh, 10 years in. Uh, that's me uh, on the left and uh, Alan, uh, my business partner, or Jenny and my business partner on the right. Uh, we started the business 10 years ago uh, without a real plan other than uh, that we wanted to make gardens and landscapes that uh, were expressions uh, and examinations of ideas and culture uh, and gave ourselves the freedom uh, and softness to uh, make mistakes and learn along the way. Uh, in the early days, we just built a lot of tiny small residential projects because when you're just too random people, uh, you big, larger projects don't come your way. And uh, Alan and I have always been very construction oriented. We like the process of making things and building things. Uh, and the residential project uh, in a way is very good for that. Uh, the feedback loop is uh, short, so you can learn and make a mistake and carry that with you onto the next project. Uh, and it was all very wonderful, actually. So and to this day, the residential project is still very much a part of our practice. And uh, in the presentation that follows, you'll see how we uh, how we balance uh, like actually just uh, meeting client needs and requirements while also uh, using built work as a way to examine uh, the ideas and uh, strategies that we're interested in. This is the before image, not an after image, but these were the, the kind of very like straightforward single family residential projects that came to us and allowed the office to survive uh, for the first three years of its existence. So now I'm going to kind of jump to present day. Uh, a working but an always changing definition for a garden or a landscape, and that's a longer lecture, uh, the difference between the word landscape and the difference and the word garden. But for uh, the sake of uh, speed, a garden is a human-led curation of materials and plants built and maintained with labor on the medium of land. And I should add, we've actually changed this definition a few times and it continues to evolve. Uh, but with that, we with that sentence that uh, we're always kind of tinkering with, uh, we are within that sentence that we're always tinkering with are four ingredients, uh, land, material, labor, and plants. Uh, as an office that prioritizes uh, reflection and examination of what it is we do and why we do what we do and for whom uh, do we make gardens, uh, what that has in turn uh, kind of led us is to really informing our relationship to every, to all, to one, two, three, and four that are on the board ahead of you, above us. Um, so we're constantly examining uh, our relationship to land. Uh, we're examining examining our relationship to materials, labor, and plants. Uh, and for better or worse, uh, 
our relationship to these ingredients, uh, the decisions we make and the way we, we interact with them uh, is inescapably kind of political. Uh, the, all the choices that we, we make, whether we're using a gravel that's from local or from far away, these all have impacts on the world around us. And so uh, it's kind of uh, a lens through which we operate our practice. And there will be blurriness between these topics and that's okay. And we'll kind of get into that as we uh, dive through the lecture. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna start with land. Um, and as David said, there's blurriness, but I'm gonna talk about land through the lens of a single project. Uh, the rest of the lecture is formatted slightly different, a couple more projects, but this we're gonna just talk about one project. We won't be able to hit every aspect of land, obviously, but I think it's a good project to, to study for that um, theme. So some ideas around land that we, especially for this project kept in mind was to read and listen to the land very closely to consider that the land is a record of our relationships, both to the land and to each other, um, and to consider space and time. Time is another element that kind of like weaves all of those four, um, yeah, all these four kind of together. Um, it's kind of everywhere all the time. Number five technically should be time. Maybe. But it gets really complicated. You guys so. can let us know at the end. For the sake think. of brevity and making this a poignant lecture, we left time out, but it's kind of in this one too. Yeah. So Laguna Canyon Foundation is a project we completed um, about a year and a half ago, and it's still one of our favorites. Um, Laguna Canyon Foundation is a nonprofit, um, and they, they steward and restore uh, wildlands in Laguna Canyon. And so I'm going to set a little bit of context for you. Feel free to jump in, whatever. Um, so this is Southern California, you know, the mass, massive swaths of gray urban areas in kind of the Los Angeles basin, but with these pockets of green, you know, wild spaces. Um, and we see Laguna Canyon, the Laguna Coast Wilderness Park as a jewel of wildlands because it's kind of surrounded by this arc of development in Orange County. Um, but it's been pretty well protected and Laguna Canyon Foundation is a big part of that. Um, their headquarters are right here, right along Laguna Canyon Creek. Um, Laguna Lakes are some of the oldest natural lakes in the area, really special and, and important to the Tatavia, um, sorry, to the Ahachiman uh, tribe. But as you can see, a lot of urbanism pressing up against the boundary of, of the canyon. Um, so, you know, we, one of the big considerations for this project was just reading the landscape, looking at how it sits in the land, the ridges, the hillsides, the valley floor, and the creek bed. Um, and then the dynamics of how those things interact together, the movement of soil, which we've seen a lot on site, um, the way that plants move through these different spaces, the way that the plants are different from top to bottom. These are all the things that you guys are learning in school and you will continue to learn throughout your careers. Um, this site was really interesting because um, of its history, it has a very interesting history. The Ahachiman used Laguna Cannon Creek to move from the beach to the lakes, um, and they were, you know, harvesting acorns along the way, um, using the willows, um, harvesting grasses for basket making. So the creek was a really integral part of their life. Um, when the European settlers came and moved into Laguna Canyon, luckily the canyon, the wildland of the canyon did not get totally taken over. So here's a little patch that's left over that's become the Laguna Canyon Foundation uh, headquarters. But this land um, in the 70s, up here at the top of the ridge where the water tower is, became a dump. Actually, I guess it was more like the 50s and 60s. And it was an illegal dump, secret. People were just going there unsanctioned, dumping their trash into um, this hollow up here, into the little valley where, the, where there's a smaller creek. Um, and what happened, it was in 2010, there was a massive uh, storm. I'm not sure if it was an atmospheric river or not, but a big storm. And this dump had actually been covered up and kind of forgotten. The storm caused a massive mud flow and the dump went pouring down the, the hillside and down all along here. And it was a massive mess of that people had even, and it was interesting because people had forgotten that it was there. So this kind of revelation of the waste of our, of our history was, was really um, upsetting to people. And it took them a while to clean up but as you can see, where the headquarters are located is actually in the middle of the ground zero for this, where they had massive trucks dealing with the cleanup. Um, it took a long, long time. They were hauling buckets out by hand from the canyon up here, but then they had this massive machinery on the hillside here. And what happened is 
those machines created terraces on the hillside that you can still read in the land today. And that actually we um, just designed around and decided to work with. Um, there is a school right next door and a, a small little neighborhood right next door as well. So this was the site when we came to it. Um, there was some kind of regeneration of the natives. You know, the natives bounced back pretty pretty well, but there were still scars of um, this dump, a dump and flood disaster from 2010 on the landscape. Um, and our task was to help Laguna Canyon Foundation make more use of their space, have a more functional um, space where they can work because they're doing active restoration all over Laguna Canyon. And they all they had was this flimsy little tent and their stuff was all being stored outside. So they needed um, some really great, some really well-designed workspaces. They needed spaces for gathering for the community. And then they wanted it to just be open to the community as well. Um, so the first thing we did was just walk and read the site and listen to as many of the staff members as, of Laguna Canyon Foundation, some tribal members, community members, just listening and reading as much as we can. Really gorgeous place, lots of history, lots of layers of history. Some really beautiful intact native ecosystems, beautiful native rock. Um, and here's the creek at the bottom. Here's a section that shows that relationship. So the hillside, and you can see these kind of flattened terraces that we decided to mostly leave and work with. So everything was basically designed around these terraces. And you can imagine that there were big machines here with big reaches dealing with all of the trash. Um, the creek we mostly left alone, that was a different grant, a different project. And I think uh, to interrupt you briefly, Please. that decision to uh, accept the topography uh, because it was functioning in a sense uh, in the in the way that it was, uh, is a is a common theme in that oftentimes we uh, to Deep Mars introduction uh, we try not to change a thing unless it needs changing um, and uh, so minimizing the impact or the footprint of our construction uh, is something that we do as a way of almost uh, thinking about reducing the energy costs of a project. Well, and it was it was reducing the carbon footprint, the energy costs, but also it was budget, right? They, they had a very limited budget. So we decided let's work with what's there. Another thing that you'll see throughout the presentation is um, accepting the past rather than trying to erase it. I mean, I think there's there's healing that you can try to do on the land, which is wonderful, but also we're not trying to erase the wrongs of the past. Yeah. So there were all these really interesting layers of history on this site. Um, there was at one point a bar, a horse barn and some agriculture going on. These old relics, we actually decided to keep on site. But as you can see, lots of invasive mustard, just a massive tangle of invasives out in the um, disturbed areas of the site. Massive patch of ice plant that they wanted to get rid of. Um, so these were all the legacies of um, the colonizers and kind of the agricultural practices that were happening on the site. And actually the um, the director of Laguna Canyon Foundation grew up, grew up horseback riding on this site. But that use is, is long gone. And now as the director, she's trying to heal the site as much as possible. Still some really a beautiful native ecologies intact, Apuntia, Baccarus, Artem uh, Artemisia, Golden Bush. Um, David's gonna talk about beauty later. But what was interesting about this site is kind of this strange beauty where you have um, these relics of the past layered together, right? So kind of all these native plants here, the invasive mustard, and this completely dead agave, which we told them to keep because it was so strange and beautiful. And they loved that. Uh, here's an overall site view. Um, here's the hollow where the ice plant was. And here's the main headquarters. So you can see these three terraces. Uh, here's the neighborhood as well to the, to the south. These are the three terraces that we preserved and repurposed. So the top terrace is the utility terrace where their storage shed, their chemical clean out, because they are using Roundup, they do restoration. It's kind of complicated and interesting to us, um, but they, they need it for their work. Uh, three nursery structures where they store can store plants and other materials. Um, and we actually had to be, do a big grading exercise because the hillside was so steep, it was tricky to pull trucks in a middle terrace for gathering and having events, teaching and learning, or just eating lunch. And then a lower terrace called the Discovery Terrace, which is more of a part of the network of trails where you can stroll along the path and, and look at all the different native plants, along with little play elements for um, the children. There's a lot of children that come to visit this site. 
So as David mentioned before, we kind of worked with the existing topography. This is over in the hollow near where the ice plant was. And there were some relics of an old road that must have been there um, to um, provide access to the horse barn. And we decided for money's sake, budget's sake, and also just efficiency, um, just to work with that topography. Um, this is the Discovery Terrace. Um, the other big thing we were doing on site here was managing water, because as you can imagine, there's lots of water moving down to the creek below. And because of budget, we decided not to hire an engineer to do kind of traditional civil engineering, because we knew that that would have led to concrete swales everywhere. So we took a softer approach, a more regenerative approach, and just did um, dry creeks all over the site that direct water. It was imperfect, as I'll tell you later, but that's okay. The fact that um, it's imperfect and that it's evolving as we go, we accept. We used a lot of uh, reused a lot of local materials as much as possible, trying to keep the budget down, but also just trying to um, minimize carbon footprint. So this, these were from Angel City Lumber. David will talk more about that later. Um, we had an overage of rock from another project that we were working on. And rather than trash it or have the contractor take it back, we decided to haul it back down to Laguna and, and use it there. So we're, we're constantly looking for ways to use materials really efficiently. Um, across all of our projects. Another thing, big theme of our work in general is improvisation in the field. So yes, we have the plans that we showed you earlier, but we are definitely going out and making changes in the field in collaboration with the contractors. So this is Carmen Orozco, one of our, one of our top contractors. We work with him all the time. We trust him. We value his opinion. Sometimes we say, where would you put this trail? And we listen to him. This is the hollow where the ice plant was. And as you can see, there's this kind of this path here, which must have been an old road. And there was this bank that um, formed the edge of the road. And we decided to work with that and have it form. It, it kind of created a natural little amphitheater. So we put this, um, this deck in the middle with more reclaimed wood around and then um, native plants that would have been down in the floodplain. Um, uh, this is a work day that we had with some of our staff. We um, we all have our own projects at Terremoto, but we do a lot of shared collaborative work as well. So this was near the end of the project, and we just invited the whole staff down to come together and move around Deadwood and make edging and make nurse law, you know, place nurse logs. And it was a really nice way to end the project, a really nice bonding experience for our staff and learning experience for everybody as well. And as you can see, we didn't get rid of all the mustard, right? It's still it's still all back here, but that's okay. Laguna Canyon Foundation knows it's an ongoing work in progress. Here's a little moment we created off the trail. We created a lot of these throughout the project for little secret places to go. Some more grand seating on the Discovery Terrace. Here are these three nursery structures, which have really become the centerpiece of the site. I love them because they're both bold, but also they allow the landscape to shine, right? The landscape around it is not taken over by them. And if anything, they kind of complement and highlight the natural beauty of the landscape. The children are using the space, which makes us really happy. That's all you can really ask for. Um, and here are some just beauty glamour shots of the space, you know, the trail, um, secret places to go to, and then working with the existing grade um, to provide greater access through the site. Um, it's Here's the, the headquarters building nestled in the site. Um, we did have an atmospheric river last year. I don't know if you guys heard about this in California. We had another one this winter. But last winter, they did suffer some damage to the site. Our drainage, some of the drainage that we had put in got completely blown out in one or two areas. And our point of view was, that's OK. The approach we took was a softer approach. And now we're going to come back and rebuild. And when you take that softer approach, it's never fixed and certain forever. You do that with the, with the understanding that there's going to be maintenance and care that has to get put into it through over time. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David to talk about materials. Uh, materials, um, I'm gonna just uh, fly through three small residential projects uh, that uh, each kind of uh, explain a point of view or a, a way of working with materials that we have. Keep it hyper-local, make new things out of old things and waste as little as possible. Uh, Platform Park uh, was a park in Culver City, Los Angeles. Uh, we were hired by a, actually a private developer and we usually don't work with developers and that's a longer conversation. But uh, we did this time and this developer wanted to actually use their money to invest in this land, which was essentially like a large flat vacant lot that had been used for construction staging. 
uh, in order to kind of build the uh, green uh, the green heart uh, of this community. Uh, it was under uh, these giant uh, light rail, uh, like this, uh, there is public transportation, contrary to popular <laughs> belief. There is some public transportation in Southern California. Um, and I'm just gonna focus on our material decisions on this project. Um, we uh, we set a, uh, a threshold for ourselves to, basically we gave ourselves a constraint, which was, uh, can we build a landscape where all the materials on this landscape come from within 100 miles of the project site? So uh, the wood that you're seeing here in both this built cube and this log that you're sitting on is from Angel City Lumber. Uh, they, along with Bay Area Redwood, are two like uh, local um, wood vendors uh, that we use who essentially take fallen lumber uh, from uh, the city uh, and then repurpose it uh, both in a natural form and as well as like a sawn form. We do this for primarily for environmental reasons, but also interestingly is that we've learned that um, doing this decision uh, creates uh, resiliency, uh, creates economic resilience uh, within our own community. So rather than relying on supply chains of taking things from really far away and bringing them across the ocean, we're using wood uh, in this case and stone uh, that uh, inherently imbues into our project a sense of uh, local, local vernacular like aesthetics, uh, as well as uh, it's cheaper uh, and better for the environment. Um, so this is uh, Chad Johnston, the builder, and Jonathan Freunds, who is a planting designer we worked with on the project, uh, kind of staring at the, uh, the material options of what we had within 100 miles. And this is as it was built. Uh, the rocks that you see here um, are also, they were from Santa Paula, so like 98 miles from our project mm -hmm. site. So some of our thresholds we got really close to. Um, and we do believe that it makes like a, a, a good case study in uh, what's, what is possible um, with material use. Uh, the next project uh, was a very small residential project in Echo Park, uh, a little hillside uh, in uh, honestly, like half a mile from where Jenny and I sit. Um, it was a uh, a beautiful mess of probably built by a former homeowner uh, retaining walls, like ascending of a little backyard. Uh, rather than destroy the thing and start with a tabula rasa approach, uh, we actually, in this instance, uh, kind of meditated on uh, the budget, uh, our client needs, and what was possible within all of that, uh, and decided to accept these kind of very much less than ideal existing conditions, and instead to work with them. Uh, I guess honoring them like in part, but uh, it, it was less about like respecting them uh, and more about being able to deliver a project that was on budget and, and perhaps like respectful to the recent history of the past of the garden. So. The images on the right uh, is what you see, kind of a, a chaotic homeowner ad hoc uh, built a uh, mess of like retaining walls and steps. Had we decided to rip these retaining walls out, uh, and I should just be frank, the budget on this project was $40,000. So had we decided to touch any of those retaining walls, uh, we would have immediately had to deal with the building department. The building department in its present form in Los Angeles, mostly orients towards uh, gross wild over engineering, uh, as well as making projects in, in cost vastly, vastly more. Which contributes to our homelessness problem. Exactly, which is a, a whole essay you can have us back for uh, mm -hmm. on its own. But um, so what we did instead is we uh, we neutralized uh, these existing conditions and kind of uh, uh, made a calm, tranquil, uh, like ver gave them a calm, tranquil veneer. Uh, these are old uh, tiles that some homeowner had put at a certain point uh, and we left them in place and just kind of went over them. Uh, we built a little meditation uh, platform for our client uh, who has a meditation practice uh, and built a retaining wall out of uh, inexpensive, readily available uh, concrete. Uh, this is a way to kind of like circumnavigate uh, the complexities of uh, the building department as well, because these are approved units. Um, and what we ended up with was this kind of like quiet meditative space, a wild garden, uh, and again, uh, old becomes new. Uh, the last project I'll talk about uh, was in uh, Pasadena in Southern California. This is a ravine. Uh, this white mass you see up to the left is our client's house. 
their the back their backyard was essentially this cliff that came down into this wash and just nothing had ever been there. Uh, we built a simple deck and boardwalk down uh, to this um, tree, and now the family has a place to go. Uh, in terms of materials, uh, what we did on this project is every uh, every spatial dimension decision that we made uh, was simply done uh, with the uh, standard uh, lumber unit uh, dimension in mind. In the United States, lumber usually comes at six feet, eight feet, 10 feet, 12 feet. So what we did is all the decisions we made were based on those intervals. So uh, you'll notice, I mean, this is mid construction, but there's almost no off cuts on this project. This made the build uh, in a way relatively straightforward, but uh, no material went to the dump. Uh, that's probably a lie. Probably a tiny bit of material uh, went to the dump, but what we did is just said, let's waste no material. Um, and so that constraint uh, then quietly, subtly informs uh, the finished aesthetic of the thing. How are we on time? Yeah. Pretty good on time, okay. 10.30. Um, so I'm gonna talk about labor now. Um, labor is a big part of our practice. We talk about it all the time. Um, even with what, even it, it dovetails with materials, right? Because that material economy that David's talking about also lend, leads to a labor efficiency, right? It's less labor when you're not cutting all these things and making fussy details. I'm going to interrupt you. We Please. also think that uh, the best construction detail would also be kind to the laborer that's building it. Uh, that's something that uh, we're trying to explore in our project, where can we design a thing that uh, doesn't, that isn't unkind to the people building it, but continue, sorry. Yeah, so that dovetails into labor. Um, we consider this in a lot of our projects, all of our projects, really. We would like to encourage others to keep a repair and care mindset, um, to, to know that maintenance is a good thing. I think in our profession, maintenance has become a bad word. Everybody wants everything to be low maintenance, and we would like to invert that sensibility. Um, we actually also see a, a big, um, there's a lot of efficiency and beauty in designing through labor and care, right? Rather than always having a plan, a rigid plan that you adhere to. Um, and then in general, we'd also just like to elevate labor and care in our profession and in our broader culture. So the first part of labor, I'm going to talk about um, our project called Test Plot, um, which if you don't know this project, um, we have a couple of our plots up on our website. You can go look at them there. There's also the testplot.info website, which you should go check out. So Testplot is an ongoing experiment in community land care um, that we co-founded with some other community members. The first one was um, also right up the street in Elysian Park. And it was essentially a reaction to a lack of care in LA's public, public parks, um, specifically in Elysian Park. You can see all of these eucalyptus trees, which were formerly fashionable, but now they're highly problematic because they're not actually evolved to survive periods of mega drought that we experience here in Southern California. Um, massive fire hazard. Yes, they support some habitat. Uh, ha they provide habitat for some native species, but not enough. Um, and the, the problem is they push out other native species, as well as the mustard and invasive grasses that dominate the ground plane of the park. Um, so we were interested to see how could we help? What can we do? Because David spoke to kind of the, the problems of bureaucracy here in Southern California and the way that it can be really stifling. So we looked for a way to pierce the bureaucracy and um, start to do native plant restoration in a very fast and agile way. And the way to do it was um, to get this garden qualified as temporary and to work with what was there. So there's an existing hose bib, we simply ran hoses off of that existing public hose bib um, as far as they would go. And the shape of the plots was determined by the throw of the sprinkler. So just keeping things, again, as economical and simple as possible. And the idea was um, to, to take these specific plots. And it, the first ones were just really an experiment. And could we get um, the ground plane and the shrub layer to regenerate over time just through volunteer labor? Um, and so it started off like this, we with a grow kill cycle where we watered, weeded, watered, weeded. This is us weeding. Um, and the first plots in Elysian Park have come a long way. This is them in their first year. They look pretty scraggly. There's plants scattered here and there. This is them more recently. They've really grown in. Um, and in fact, more recently than this, we've, we've uh, taken some of the fencing off. 
we're freeing ourselves from the confines of the circles and expanding the plots even more, which was also part of the original vision was we're starting with these plots, but could we um, potentially do little test plots everywhere and um, in that fashion, regenerate Elysian Park. This is a recent photo from, from the park as well, uh, from, from the Elysian Park plots. Um, so pretty successful and so successful that there are now, I think about 10 test plots um, in Southern California and Northern California. And test plot is, has become an official nonprofit. So we started with a little seed of an idea of what could just through volunteer labor of us and other community members, what could we achieve with, you know, with permission of Rec and Parks. And it has spiraled out from there to become something much bigger than us, which is um, really heartwarming to see. So this was the second test plot achieved um, in collaboration with the University of Southern California and Jen Toy, who's one of our partners in test plot. Um, again, really humble beginnings. You can see really difficult site conditions, fascinating history on this site that I don't have time to go into, but a lot of compaction. Um, and that this is the site more recently. So it's pretty inspiring to see what's possible through a little bit of labor. So test plot really is a celebration of labor. We're not afraid of the idea of maintenance, of having your hands in the soil. And I think we're, we're trying to invert the narratives that have dominated landscape in the last couple of decades, which is that um, um, I think that like custom details that you've never seen before that blow your mind, really sexy renderings. This is like the opposite of that. This is very humble and simple boots on the ground it's it's hands in the soil it's boots on the ground hands in the soil this is our, our baldwin hills test plot um and the designs of a lot of these test plots came through emerged through the work on the land so yes we did some planning but a lot of times um the exact articulation was figured out on site together in collaboration with community members um a really important tenet of, of test plot is our volunteers and the fact that every volunteer group at all the different plots has a different work style and work schedule. And so we try to meet the community where they're at. And there is no one model for volunteering a test plot. Every test plot has different community partners, um, diverse community members, and every test plot is different. And what we do is we um, work with the community members to figure out what works for them. Um, so there- And this yeah. is why we are official. we are here by daring the University of Manitoba to do a test plot as well. We do. Yeah. We, we we dare you. Yeah. <laughs> I love <laughs> that. Ahead. I love that. Um, you know, working with kids, um, there is no one size fits all model. So it's through, again, it's through the labor on the land and through the like listening to the land and the time taken to work on the land that we figure out what's right for each specific site. All the invasives are different at every different site, right? So the work models all have to be very customized. This is um, a test plot on campus at University of Southern California. And what's great about it, what's been great about it for the program is that they've been able to teach the students what it takes to plant a plant. A lot of these students at, the, at USC had never planted a plant before in their life. Um, so it's interesting, you know, that you can become a landscape architect and not understand that labor that it, that it takes to make these landscapes happen. So that's been a big, um, boon to the, to the University of Southern California program. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some new things we're doing in test plot, um, that are really rooted in labor. So we're doing a lot of experiments in different ways of laboring. Um, so a lot of new experiments with seed. Um, and kind of a bringing in that time element again, right? Like slowing down and changing our labor. So rather than coming in hard and planting a bunch of plants, coming in very lightly, periodically over time, tending to these seedlings. Um, so the first slide is scything down the invasives. And then after that, we roughed up the ground and sowed the seeds. The second, the second image is um, weeding out some of the grasses so that the seedlings can thrive. You can see the invasive mustard looming large in the background. Uh, this was our Rainbow River at the first Elysian test plot. So this was our first seed experiment, which was a wild success. We were very lucky because we did get an atmospheric river that winter. We're doing another round this winter. We're curious to see how it's going to go. Um, it was really incredible to see the wildlife that came. These are white line sphinx moths, sphinx moth caterpillars. And there were hundreds of them all along this river and throughout the plots. It was really gorgeous. Here it is snaking up and down the hillside. This design was manifested on site. There was no drawing. 
There was no plan. The design came through the work itself, through the labor. Um, here's one of our new experiments where we're testing different methods of labor. So on the right, Danny's hand weeding. So we've got two rows of um, seeded shrubs and uh, chaparral and coastal sage scrub species. Danny's hand weeding, the middle two rows, Dante is scything. And we made the cutest keep out signs ever, I thought. It was funny. Yeah, I, I read some pretty harsh <laughs> language with keep out, and then Hannah in our office softened it with some really beautiful flowers. Um, our new our newest test spot that we're really excited about is the burn scar. I, you should talk about this one. Uh, I go on morning walks in this park, and a there was an encampment in the park. It caught on fire. It created this fire. Southern California has a woefully, uh, we we don't interact with fire, basically. All fires are put out immediately. That's a much larger discussion that I'm also sure you're having in Canada as well about fire suppression tactics and how that has gotten our fire situation to where it is. But uh, we actually jumped on this sad thing that happened as an opportunity to um actually uh, build a test plot in a burn scar. Um, so we're experimenting with fire followers. Um, and our first step in this project was um, breaking down the charred wood and building kind of paths that will allow uh, our volunteers to move through the site and not trample everything. I think what I love about this, this one also is just the strange beauty of this, right? Like we took this kind of, um, this, uh, scar and on the landscape and it was a tangle of burned wood and our last volunteer day was simply us coming out and organizing the wood and rearranging it in a beautiful way. Um, David's going to talk a little bit more about beauty too, but I think that speaks to that a lot. Um, doing experiments in um, harvesting the invasive mustard to actually create dye, natural dye for clothing, collaborating with clothing makers. So we, we look for opportunities to um, put our bodies on the land as much as possible, and we don't shy away from it. And we would love to encourage people everywhere to do that. It really helps alleviate climate anxiety. Um, one last topic on labor is that we have an internal uh, working group at Terremoto called our Land and Labor Working Group. We've always, David and Alan from the very beginning, always really celebrated process. Process and being on site was always really important and working alongside the guys. We formalized that in 2020 into our Land and Labor Working Group. Um, we're inspired by Michelle Franco from the University of Ohio, who says, for designers concerned with social and spatial justices, it is necessary to expand the context of landscape work beyond a site's physical and historic narratives to include the context itself. Um, read this article called Invisible Labor, if you can. Uh, we have a lot of themes that we're working on together in our office, um, cr including credit and representation, just breaking the cycle of the media covering only the designers and trying to include all of our collaborators in those credits. Um, collaborating with people on site, like we said, we do draw plans, but a lot of times we improv on site um, alongside of our, of our collaborators. Ensuring that they're adequately compensated, talking about class and skill, thinking about immigration, capitalism, exploitation, safety and risk, and really just revaluing labor and land care. Again, trying to push our, our profession and our broader culture to value stewardship and care on the land. Lots of, lots of light, easy topics. <laughs> Super easy breezy. <laughs> so easy breezy that after we wrote this article in Metropolis, which if you haven't read it, you should, we had to take a break for a year because we were so overwhelmed and kind of lost. And actually right now our group is reforming and we're really exciting about, excited about the next chapter. Um, but we had to kind of be kind to ourselves. We felt so bad that we, but this, these are really big overwhelming topics that are hard to deal with. Um, also, we, we try to have ongoing relationships with our gardeners as much as possible, returning to sites um, over the years and being on constant text communication with our gardeners because they carry the design forward, right? We do the design, but they're just as important. Um, I'm going to skip over the office stuff. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, and what we're, we're skipping to... over is uh, the, the critique mm -hmm. that we give of the larger, larger labor industry uh, in Southern California, or all of California. We also apply that same examination to ourselves internally as an office. And we have uh, better than regular, dare I say, pretty darn good labor practices within our office. And that goes from how many hours, a, how we pay our staff to uh, the number of hours a week that people work to uh, our profit sharing model, which is presently at 
40% of all profit is shared in a, an egalitarian way uh, across the office. So things we're tinkering with. And, and also constantly interrogating that, right? Like always open to feedback and trying to hear from our, our staff about what works best for them. Uh, we'll wrap up with planting and beauty. Uh, we wanna talk to everyone too, so I'll be quick. Um, honor and respecting what's there uh, and mostly native plants. Um, this is Jenny's beautiful project. Uh, uh, there is no, not be named. Uh, yeah, uh, there is no tabula rasa uh, in land, in garden design or landscape architecture, though if you studied the recent history of our profession, you might not see it. You might not think that's so. Uh, our industry uh, and profession problematically uh, will erase all existing conditions to create a new thing. Uh, we try not to do that for reasons we've already gone over in this lecture, but uh, this is an existing uh, oak woodland uh, in Altadena, uh, Southern California. And um, we kept uh, all the oaks. The first thing we do when we come to a site like this is we get uh, get a, a certified arborist with whom, whom we trust to start taking care of the trees. And then uh, we are very thoughtful in terms of how we plant the ground plane underneath existing trees to make sure that everything we're planting uh, is good uh, and we don't need to suddenly start watering trees and endanger their health. Um, and also in general, left to our own devices, uh, we plant uh, gardens that are mostly native. Uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but uh, native plants are plants that have evolved uh, to be uh, where they are uh, in the world, meaning uh, in addition to requiring fewer external inputs like water and fertilizer, they don't really need. Uh, they, they also uh, offer uh, habitat uh, and are useful to the creatures with whom we share this earth, um, whether that be earthworms or butterflies or birds. Um, this is the project uh, where in Sonoma, where uh, a ground up house was built uh, during the construction of the ground up house, uh, we did our best to play uh, bodyguard uh, or, or earth guard to the landscape uh, and limit the uh, limit the destructive uh, footprint of the construction of the house. As the house construction ended, we then softly graded paths, uh, reused all existing uh, boulders on site um, and uh, hydro seeded a native meadow. And I guess I'll start like drifting into to beauty now. Um, a, th a thing, an em emerging thing, uh, a theme that like we've been discussing um, in our office. Actually, here's what I want to do. You, well, you, I was going to say. I'll keep going. Yeah. A little bit. Okay, okay, okay. I won't go into beauty quite yet. I was um, going to say you should. Should you talk about? You know, it's not always native. Sure. Okay. Uh, the native plant community also sometimes does itself a disservice. We've noticed by. Uh, creating a binary uh, or uh, or being overly dogmatic and saying that a native plant is good and non-native plant is bad. Uh, given uh, the state of our world and culture and the way that people move, uh, we don't think it's necessarily that black and white. The Sopuntia, this prickly pear, which you see in the upper left of the image, uh, is not native, though it's regionally appropriate, but it's not native to, this is actually my front yard, uh, to Southern California or Los Angeles. Um, that being said, uh, we need to give ourselves uh, the the latitude and the wiggle room in that uh, people come from different places and they bring with them their gardening cultures. And so uh, we need to allow for the latitude therein. I wouldn't go so far as to say like we need to make space philosophically or for invasive species. There's like a there's a certain type of a plant and we need that needs to be studied and be done thoughtfully. But our gardens are generally a mix of uh, uh, native plants and regionally appropriate plants. And all of this comes with a different aesthetic. Um, and uh, when the when we, when we build a garden, both for the people uh, who will be using it, but also for the birds and the bees and uh, to let water get through the ground, uh, these considerations start to change the way like our gardens might look. Uh, but I believe that we need a new aesthetic uh, to uh, to reflect, I think the need, the the yearning that we all have for like a different relationship with the earth. Um, I'm going to be quiet as I just go through these. Yeah, actually. let me just let them speak for themselves. Again, this is Jenny's project where we, the first thing we did is protect the oaks, and then. 
uh, thoughtfully think on uh, the site's conditions and evaluate what kind of plant would want to be where and why. Um, so now I'll drift into beauty. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll start here. Uh, landscapes uh, inescapably reflect the the values or the relationship a, a society or culture has to nature. Uh, and I would argue that uh, I'm not here to like discredit like this sort of a landscape or this sort of a landscape, which is, which is a modern masterpiece. Uh, but I would say uh, both this, this, and this uh, really uh, reflect uh, a culture uh, that wants to impose its vision of beauty on the land rather than work with the land. Uh, it's easy to like poke at Versailles as like a scapegoat, but uh, this to me looks like uh, a garden of a culture that doesn't have the healthiest relationship to landscape. Um, and so because our office is in, our, because our office believes that uh, we uh, as a species kind of need to uh, find a better way of being with each other and we need to find a better way of like being with the world. We're interested um, in exploring what uh, gardens that reflect a healthy, healthier relationship uh, to the environment, what that might look like. Uh, this is a garden that we're building on a vacant lot. Uh, it's in collaboration with a friend and artist named David Horvitz. And this garden had no plan. Uh, we don't actually own the land. We have permission from the landlord uh, who owns the property to build this garden. And uh, this is it in its early form. Uh, and this garden is a manifestation of being us, us and David and the community, the kind of uh, creative community of Los Angeles, being present uh, on a site. Uh, almost all the materials uh, are recycled materials. Uh, we have oyster shells from restaurants and gravel from Terremoto projects and uh, very little was purchased on this project. Um, but we weeded, uh, we planted mostly native plants. Uh, it's constantly being changed. Uh, benches, uh, rebar, there will be an art exhibit. We try to make the garden as useful and open to all uh, as is able. Uh, currently, it does close and lock at night. In a perfect world, it wouldn't. We're trying to figure out uh, how we balance that threshold. Um, but this way of working or this way of being with land comes with different aesthetics. Uh, and dare we say that uh, it's very beautiful uh, and deserves uh, consideration uh, as one way of working. We're not like denouncing landscape architecture and saying, don't draw plans. Plans are useful, uh, plans are necessary, but I, we do believe that this is a, a compelling case study in uh, exploring a different way of working. And what's interesting uh, and exciting to us is we believe this could scale. Uh, there's no reason uh, public parks uh, at a vaster scale uh, through presence, through uh, joining humans to land, uh, through allowing for experimentation and tinkering and serendipity Fail, yeah, failure. and failure. Um, it, if beauty is found like uh, in aliveness, uh, I think this garden is, we, we believe that this garden to be very beautiful because it is so alive. Uh, and that's our lecture. Did we it do- It looks like people are clapping. We can't do. <laughs> I see a little bit of this. <laughs> so maybe Jenny. So if you don't mind, we might have a few minutes, seconds for. Oh, wait. The screen. So you are disconnected. We want to have you again here. We stop the share. Is that? Can you hear me? Yes. We can. So maybe I keep on going speaking while we try to connect you again to our screen. Okay. So okay. thank you so much. I sometimes the audience is we try to ask questions. If I would be a student, I would ask you right away, how can I apply for an internship? You know. <laughs> 
your desks and your office should get flooded. So I would apply right away not <laughs> a for coffee and more. I'm not sure how, if you can imagine how you speak actually to my heart and my soul with your projects and how you approach landscape architecture. Landscape architecture is a co concept also to work with, to borrow landscape. I borrow a few words again from you know, the jury uh, when you received the office award. Quote, Terremoto has the power to effortlessly challenge the old certainties and recipes our profession is based on. The result are spaces that are simply generous and look incredibly comfortable. End of quote. I would add, and Terremoto actions, uh, or their actions, that are simply human, ethically responsible, aesthetically appealing, simply forward-looking, and truly exemplary. I hope the audience agrees with me. And I would like to open the floor for a few questions. Are there questions from the floor? Or comments or criticisms? We welcome disagreement. If you don't mind, because you know, acoustic disconnection, if you come here to ask the question right close to Imar, the there's also a question in the chat. Am I good to go? Go go ahead and then we take the chat afterwards. Hi, I'm Kira. Um so just okay. because this is a different aesthetic than people are normally sorry, are normally used to in garden designs. I was curious if you have a hard time convincing people that this is like a look they want to go for, um, or is it generally pretty accepted as like something to move forward with? You know, may I? Yeah. Um, thank you, Kira. Um, it's a good question. Um, I would say uh, the honest answer is that in the early days of the office, um, I think uh, our relationship to aesthetics and or uh, ethics and or our wor world view was less formed and we were also, we just needed money. <laughs> so uh, I would say that we've also done, pro we, we've done, historically we did projects that perhaps uh, fell more into like conventional garden design. Uh, as we've grown, as we've, uh, as we've grown a reputation, uh, as we've proved our concept, I think many times, now uh, more often than not, we are spoiled uh, because people come to us for that other thing. People don't really reach out to us for a boxwood parterre English garden because I think if they looked at our website. I have one client. Oh, sure. But, uh, yeah. Sure, but then, but also uh, sometimes uh, clients will say they want that yeah. wild thing, but then we'll somewhere in the uh, course of the project, we'll actually realize that they do want that more tradition, mm -hmm. traditional thing. Uh, and so uh, it a, becomes a matter of choosing our battles, uh, like winning people over with kindness uh, and respect uh, and um, yeah, walking our walk. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess that's the- We, we also, you know, you, you say a lot that we don't have a singular style. And I think that's true. I yeah. think we, especially in California where the housing styles are also different, we love playing around with different styles. So like, don't get us wrong. We love like doing a Japanese garden or doing a formal garden with, but all with native plants or something. So it's not that we're saying it needs to be rigidly, you know, only this one aesthetic. It's just that um, maybe opening up your heart and mind to something a little more wild and and free. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So we have we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, so if anyone, either Renee or uh, Devin, Chris, if you want to ask your question, feel free to turn your mic on. Otherwise, I can read it for you. So I'll give you a second to hop on it if you want. Who is okay. first? This is Devin. Oh, Devin, okay, can, yeah, go can ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, um, yeah. go ahead. So I'll read my question, I guess. So uh, I'm a practitioner on, in uh, Nova Scotia. I'm on the complete opposite end of the continent uh, from you. Um, we have challenges. Uh, procuring the quantity of native plants needed for many of our projects. 
obviously focus for many nurseries is on propagating ornamentals. And how have you worked with growers over the years to make your projects possible? Uh, we do and we don't. I guess uh, we're we're slightly spoiled. Uh, it's a great question, Devin. Um, we're slightly spoiled by the fact that we live in a like a relatively large economic engine, uh, and because California uh, has that, uh, there are built-in kind of horticultural industries. Uh, that being said, within the world of wholesale horticultural production, there's a lot of inertia, there's a lot of bad practices, uh, and it's a thing that we bump into all the time. So uh, when able or, or when logical, we sometimes contract grow for projects. Um, and oftentimes we talk to our, uh, we're, we're friendly with uh, Barrelwood Tree Farm, which is this excellent uh, tree farm uh, an hour north of here. Uh, and in becoming, in starting to do business with them, we let them know that we were going to want a lot of fern leaf Catalina ironwoods, which is the Lyonothamnus floribundus. Uh, and that's like a tree that's not really, that many, several years ago wasn't presently like in production because it wasn't a tree that was bought. Uh, but uh, the market economy doesn't always necessarily make the best decisions. So we let them know that they now produce those and we can get them in 24 inch and 36 inch box sizes. Uh, and so that's great. Uh, and then also through, uh, we like to think that through building gardens that look different, that then plants that were formerly unfashionable become so. And uh, the free market, which does have its perils, but one thing that it does really well is respond to those sorts of changes. And if a plant starts selling and showing up in gardens everywhere, the uh, wholesale growers are astute enough to respond and start propagating that plant. Uh, but if you live somewhere more rural, Devin, then it's possible you might have to take on some of that yourself. Our new office has a space and we haven't started it yet, but we aspire to start propagating some of our own plants uh, because even though the wholesale native plant industry in Southern California is quite robust, there are still certain things that just aren't really in cultivation that we want to use. So uh, I guess your question is, how do you change culture? And it's like mm -hmm. uh, patience, uh, impatience, and choosing your battles and figuring out like what you can take on. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, Renee, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Hi, thank you guys so much. I'm a huge fan of your work. And I'm currently a Master's of Landscape Architecture student um, at the University of Arizona. And I was wondering what your biggest uh, suggestions or your advice would be to a uh, first year MLA student? You. Okay. Um, I would say as a, for a first year, I would say just be really open, open-hearted, open-minded to your teachers and your peers in your first year. Um, you're just beginning a really long journey. In fact, I, I'm still learning every day. So um, don't get, if you, if you feel frustrated that you don't know things, that's a totally normal feeling. Um, it's frustrating when you don't know things. It's also frustrating when you know things. I, I, I sometimes find the longer I practice, the harder it gets because you, you know too much and it makes decision-making really difficult. So have fun and um, look up, you know, look up to the, to your, your uh, professors and peers and listen to them. Um, and sometimes, you know, do what you're told, push the boundaries when, when you can a little bit here and there, but in your first year, you're really just trying to absorb. There's a lot of lessons in your first year that you, you might not think, um, really matter, like how to tear the trace paper, but they matter down the line. And those things, those things down the line in your profession are going to come in, in handy. Everyone at our office tears trace paper beautifully. <laughs> I like that. That's what you chose. <laughs> I don't know why that's what I chose. Yeah, <laughs> little things like that, though that that seem like they're they don't matter, but it's good to get in that in those habits. Awesome! Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, come up and ask. Come. Then I think we have one more in the chat. Yeah, a couple in the chat. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sweet. 
Uh, I might be a little bit louder, so I might just walk up a little bit, step back. No, no, no. Come, come close. Sure. It's all good. You're it's good. good. Hey, I hope I don't hurt your ears then. Uh, so uh, from the beginning of the slides, you kind of talked about uh, you guys designed on top of a hill where there was a kind of like people placing their dumps. And then from there, there was like a little bit of a, I, I don't know if it was like a mudslide. Yeah. Uh, and then you also said that you kind of did like a soft design. And then from there, there was another time where the water came down and it kind of mm -hmm. destroyed a bit of the area that you kind of designed. Have you guys ever, yeah. thought, since also you got to think about radical type of designs, have you guys ever tried to implement looking at even, let's say, hoping for, let's say, another mudslide to happen to somehow <laughs> enhance the uh, designs that you guys make? Well, I love this question. It's a good one. It's such a great question. And no, we haven't like hoped for a mudslide, but I will say I just went to a potential client's house this week who had had a mudslide and he was calling us in to fix it. And I think I'm going to write him and say, we would love to work with you if you leave the mudslide. So not that we hope that the mudslide would happen, but it actually created this really gorgeous gravel garden that I'm going to try to convince the client to just leave in place rather than bring in trucks to try to remove it out and take it somewhere. I would also, to add to that, um, uh, studying failure, or uh, failure is the wrong word, but studying uh, phenomena like that are perhaps less than ideal uh, as a means of like learning from it and trying to challenge our own ways of working and what we think is right or wrong is like an interesting question. And, um, but part of the, and this kind of goes back to, had we gotten the, this project that we're looking at, uh, had we got it engineered by like a modern structural engineer, uh, concrete, re uh, the, the, the budget of the project would have wildly grown. Uh, the, the rainwater would have been probably whisked off mm -hmm. the site and put into the stormwater system. And, so in Jenny's decision to kind of go with this soft engineering, uh, we were explicit with the client that like it will be less perfect if that's your if that's how you describe uh, perfection. Mm. Uh, and so uh, and the small amount of repair that had to happen after this relatively modest mudslide uh, still cost a 20th of what actually engineering the site would have done. And the environmental impact of heavy engineering on the site uh, was simply undesirable for all those reasons. So sometimes the culture of landscape architecture and engineering, uh, what we do is we put up our hands a lot and say, why are we doing it this way? Because uh, there's a lot of wisdom around and there's also a lot of bullshit around. And so like trying to understand uh, where the true wisdom is and uh, what information is actually a relic of the past and needs to be questioned is like a thing that we do. Um, but we just do it really politely, basically. But I love your question. And now I'm going to, I'm going to. Mudslide um, garden. Yeah. Like look for a mudslide garden. So thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> to propose a mudslide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Sweet. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Now we're a couple minutes over time. Do you mind taking one? No, we're fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this one's from the chat. It's from Chris Rothery. He asks, could you talk about the challenges of working so collaboratively with community members on so many projects? I appreciate that the office values uh, lead to these things like test plot, but do you run into conflict with other facets in the industry? Hmm. That's an interesting question. We have not really had problems yet. I think we are, we're a different beast though, because we work primarily in residential, right? That's like our bread and butter. And so in doing that, we're able to um, create a, a a pot of money that then we can put back into our community projects. Um, other firms that work primarily for developers or for public, you know, for, Entities. yeah, um, for public agencies, that kind of work is really different, right? It's a totally different contract structure, totally different um, requirements for permitting and community engagement. So we are, we play a little flat, fast and loose and we get to do it our way because we work in residential. And I would also say like test plot, all of our projects that are community oriented, um, it's casual. Uh, we haven't uh, taken on a lot of work that requires formal public input at whatever intervals. Uh, a thing that uh, we 
wrestle with uh, or a thing that we struggle with at our office is that, of course, we as aspire to do large public projects. Uh, but uh, the problem is, is that the ecosystem or the culture of large public projects uh, almost would require our, our office to become more corporate than it presently is. And that's not something that we want in that uh, we would need to have a marketing department and we would need to. So it's it's a funny thing that we're wrestling with how and when and why uh, would we engage with a, a project that re would require a bureaucracy of our office that we presently don't have. Uh, I don't have an answer to that. So that's something that we bump up against. Um, we think we know we could pull it off, but uh, it would be a, a funny uh, coalescing of how do we do a thing that requires formal bu bureaucracy when we kind of generally try to resist engaging with bureaucracy because it stifles innovation and radical quick change for the environment. It, we really are students of Julian Raxworthy and his book Overgrown, which calls for a return for landscape. It calls for landscape architecture to return to its gardening roots. Yep. And we really strongly believe that landscape architecture needs to move away from engineering. It actually needs to move away from architecture. I even question the, the term landscape architecture sometimes because I think the, our climate crisis demands that we soften our approach. It demands that we not put concrete swales everywhere, which are carbon intensive and are bad for the watershed. It demands these softer solutions. Um, so, you know, the softer the solution, the easier it is to get it permitted and to get community approval because it's not such a big deal, right? It's actually like a quieter, it's a quiet project. It's not, it doesn't require engineering and permitting and all those things. So um, we kind of seek out projects that uh, we know are gonna go smoothly. Yeah, not that we're adverse to like conflict. Oh but, no. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's a rambling answer to your question maybe. Great, thank you guys. Um, I think this thank actually you. ties in well to, the, I think what might be our last one here. Um, okay. So this comes from Susanna in the chat again. She asks, what words would you use to describe this desired contemporary landscape as a reflection of our culture society? Um, and should we have to, na oh, that we have to nature, sorry, and the environment from your perspective, what should it include? Hair. I think resilience. Um, Community. Yeah. It, a really well-designed garden um, re requires those thoughtful inputs. Um, the term ecological gardening uh, is floating around and I think it's, a, it's as good as a thing that, uh, a good of a descriptor uh, as I, I found. Um, not the best answer. Oh, yeah, I think pretty good. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, David, I think most of our students are expected to be back in classroom soon. Attendance yeah. here is still mandatory. Yeah, go to class. <laughs> go yeah. to class. One, one, one more thing. Um, maybe to conclude. It's a loosely translated uh, from a uh, no phrase from Willem Flusser, the wonderful philosopher and design crit uh, critic. He someone mentioned he would or he would love to live in a world of smiling gardens, but mm -hmm. the reality is in many cases we surround ourselves with a world of ridiculous gardens. <laughs> So I have the feeling, you know, with your projects and your approach, you are very inspiring. And it's very supportive, you know, to change that, to turn the ridiculous into the smiling again. And there's another aspect, I assume, and I'm so glad when I read that you received the Office Award, it's so well deserved. But I think when you would submit some of these projects, you know, I admire but maybe to a ASLA, you know, our professional associations, it would be hard to get an award. And I was asking Mimi, you know, she's the dean and probably the only architect in the room here mm -hmm. listening to, to, you know, to our lectures, talking mm -hmm. about plants and chlorophyll. 
when she speaks some German as well, and maybe she can might help me. In German, it works very well in German. There's a phrase it calls there's architecture mit Auszeichnung. So architectural projects receiving an award. Architecture mit Auszeichnung or ausgezeichnete architecture. How would you translate that, Mimi? Outstanding, it's excellent. So your work is excellent, but there's no guarantee in the moment that you will receive an award for all this work because you guys, you are so far ahead. But I have mm. to say, I think I have the feeling I was very successful with my, with my search. You now looking for some of the last angels in landscape architecture, I will add you to my list. And this is Thank not you. a religious statement. This is not a religious statement. <laughs> you know, you don't have to believe in angels or guardian angels, but it's good to have one. And landscape need guardian angels. So thank you very much, you know, for your talk. Fantastic. And I can thank tell you. you the attendance was excellent today. Thank, thank you. you so thank much, you David, yeah. Jenny. We're thankful to be here. And thank you for everyone for listening. And to you, Dimar, as well. You're on our angel list too, Dimar. Yeah, you're an angel too. Keep in touch, please. And are we allowed to share your email address in case there are some applications? <laughs> uh, info yeah. at terramoto.la. It would be great. That's something for Brandy. I'm not really sure if, he, if she listens still. We would like to add your name to our co-op list. Would be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no oh, more part of the program. <laughs> cool. It's info at terramoto.la, Brandy. David, Jenny, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Take care. It will Thanks, keep everyone. in touch. We will. Bye. Bye.